Hello, I'm Dr. Scott Wadier. And I'm Tommy Welling, and you're listening to the Fasting for Life podcast. This podcast is about using fasting as a tool to regain your health, achieve ultimate wellness, and live the life you truly deserve. Each episode is a short conversation on a single topic with immediate actionable steps. We cover everything from fat loss and health and wellness to the science of lifestyle design. We started Fasting for Life because of how fasting has transformed our lives, and we hope to share the tools that we have learned along the way. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Fasting for Life podcast. My name is Dr. Scott Wadier, and I'm here, as always, with my good friend and colleague, Tommy Welling. Good afternoon to you, sir. Hey, Scott. How are you? Fantastic, my friend. As always, one day I'm going to mix it up on you and be like, man, I'm terrible. I just need some help. <laughs> yeah, right. Just kidding. All right, let's rock and roll today. I'm excited for today's conversation. We alluded to this topic the other day, and we're going to talk about hunger. Dun, dun, dun. Yes, mm. we're going to talk about what hunger is. We're going to share some really cool research articles that have come out recently. We mentioned it on a couple episodes ago that we're going to do a deep dive into this specific article. So I'm excited to have that conversation today and unpack kind of what it looks like to simulate a fasting journey into your day-to-day life. That is what we are about, the Fasting for Life podcast, lifestyle, lifestyle adaptation, adopting a fasting lifestyle to help you reach your goals, lose the weight, get healthier, reverse diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. If you are new, thanks for giving us a shot and listening in. We hope that you take some value out of today's conversation. If you want to know more about our journey, head back to episode one, give it a listen. We share why we do what we do and that we continue to bring episodes each and every week. Shout out to you OGs as well. The reviews keep growing, the downloads keep growing, the listens keep growing, and we are just forever grateful for you guys that keep coming back for more. We saw a cool, I'll do it just an impromptu shout out. I don't know who it was or where it was, but I know it was on the reviews and it said <laughs> something like, I've been following since the beginning and I keep learning new stuff. Nice. Like, Love that. I don't know who that was. We might've already done the shout out, but I saw it the other day and I was like, man, that's in it to win it. I really appreciate yeah, that. Because cool. honestly, I can't believe that we still have so much to talk about with something so simple, hmm. right? Yeah, Fasting so is simple, so simple, right? right? Yeah. So basic. Okay. Yeah. Let's hop into it, Tommy. So the article today is changes in hunger and fullness in relation to gut peptides before and after eight weeks of alternate day fasting. So Tommy, let's unpack what alternate day fasting is and then what modified alternate day fasting is. And that's what they actually used in the study. Yeah. And, and hunger and fullness are you know, obviously going to be big pieces of the puzzle too, because they're kind of affecting me on a minute to minute and day to day basis too. Decision to decision, emotion yeah. to emotion. Right. <laughs> moment to moment and even temptation to temptation. So the cool thing here is that if we can understand what's going on with hunger, what's going on with fullness, how does fasting affect these things? Because this is a kind of a major objection or fear point that we hear a lot about when people, especially when people are first getting into fasting or they're trying to figure out how to, how to get the weight off or how to you know, kind of get control of the situation. And there's always this concern like that my hunger is just going to keep I'm growing. going to starve. Right. And then I'm going to eat everything. So what's the point? You know, like they can just see their my fitness pal or their lose it just being, you know, through off the charts, you know. So when we look at alternate day fasting, which is a very, very powerful fasting protocol, we absolutely love it. But we have to understand that there is, you know, if we if we look at a clean, strict alternate day fasting versus a modified alternate day fasting, the modified version is more common where you have one full day of fasting and, oh, excuse me, I'm going to mix up the terminology because on the modified version, they actually call the fasting day, that's your 25% caloric intake day. So it's not quite a fasting day the way we usually talk about it. And that's why it feels kind of backwards. And then the other day will be a 100% of your calorie needs. In some studies, they just call it an ad libitum day where they just say, okay, eat as you normally would. And then the other side of that would be on a strict, if you will, alternate day fasting protocol, then it would be a 100% ad libitum day followed by a full burn day, a full you know, period without any calories coming in, right? And one of the fears of hunger, we'll unpack the four types of hunger here in just a second. One of the fears of this thing is, man, I get so hungry. In our family, we call it hangry, right? When my wife has an eating, we get hangry. 
And I didn't experience that with fasting after doing it for the first few weeks. And there's mm. some, they're going to unpack some of the reasons why we, we think that is from a physiology standpoint, and some of the stuff that's in this article, but there's this fear on with ADF specifically that on your full nutrition days, it's like going to be all you can eat buffet style, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I yeah. know we mentioned that recently in another episode where we were talking about this, where it's like, all right, hit the Ponderosa, hit the Lubies, hit the whatever <laughs> the, golden the, all, the golden corral. That's why I always forget that one, probably because it's awful. And I've never been, so I can't say that. But uh, I've, I've um, been too many times from, <laughs> from way back in the day. Yeah. I'm going to put you on the couch here, sir. Um, so no, it wasn't necessarily my choice. No, <laughs> this okay, was like okay, a family, yeah. yeah, family thing. Gotcha. So I love yeah. the idea. Of, okay, so this is one of the biggest hurdles with fasting. Is okay. I'm going to be hungry, and then the second thing is the food. So mm -hmm. I was listening to I don't remember who it was in the podcast fasting space. They're on a podcast, and they're mentioning the first two mistakes they see with fasting is you know you don't put intention into the food you're eating when you break your fast, or you don't make better food choices, which is part of the health equation, right? You don't have to revamp everything from the start, but it is part of it. And then also sticking to the same exact fasting schedule every single day, right? So sure. that second part of the food component is we're going to unpack that in the second half of today's conversation, but the hunger component, and then the, well, what do I eat? Am I going to overeat? Like cravings, hunger, like where do I... How do I handle that? How do I compartmentalize that? Like, what's that going to be like, right? So understanding hunger is something we do in every one of our challenges too, because there's four different types of hunger. Mm -hmm. So there's physical, emotional, taste, and practical, right? The taste is you're just eating something like special occasion, like birthday cake, red velvet cupcake, pumpkin spice season, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. The practical is, well, I'm going to eat now because I'm going to be busy later. Mm. Right. So it's yeah. anticipation to physical hunger. But the two big categories that we talk a lot about are the physical and the emotional. So physical hunger, it's very gradual, open to all different foods. It's based in the stomach. It's pretty patient, right? You yeah. had just mentioned before we're hopping on, hey, my stomach's growling, but I'm not really hungry, right? Sure. Yeah. I can feel it. I can hear it, but I, I wouldn't just go, oh man, I'm, I'm just so hungry right now. But you know, I, I, I can still feel it. You can feel this kind of gradual increase. So like you said, it's patient, it's open to other foods. And, and that's a good thing. I would call it more or less real hunger or the, the much more likely to be real hunger, especially right. when I'm contrasting it versus the, the emotional you know, side of that equation. And it's out of a physical need. It's deliberate choices. You're aware you're eating, right? So we're not talking snacking and binging and finishing a whole sleeve of Oreos or whatever. Mm -hmm. You stop eating or when you're full. Or breaking fast early. Or breaking fast early, right? So yeah. you stop eating when you're full or you're realizing that like, yeah, I have to eat, right? Mm -hmm. The emotional side is it's sudden. It's usually very specific for a food. It's between the ears. It's very urgent. It's usually paired with some form of emotion, halt, ang hung, uh, happy, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, bored, stressed, happy, mm -hmm. you know, emotional type things. It involves automatic or absent-minded stuff, right? Where sure, I used to yeah. find myself snagging the sausages off my kids' plates. You don't stop, about it. right? You don't even think about it. You don't stop, oh, it wants to go to waste. You don't stop when you're full. And then there's the emotion, like the guilt or the shame that comes with it being like, oh man, I did it again, right? Yeah, and yeah. emotional hunger is a normal form of hunger. It's not something that's, should be ignored, right? It, it does help with our relationship with food and long-term health metrics. Mm -hmm. But that physical hunger is something that we're going to talk about with this article where the change in hunger and fullness in relation to gut peptides before and after eight weeks of alternate day fasting. So there's some players in here in terms of peptides, leptin, and we'll unpack those in just a second. But the big takeaway, Tommy, was the results that they saw as they progressed through the 10 weeks. Yeah, which is interesting because again, going back to when I'm starting first starting to fast or thinking about it, I can be really concerned about how hard these hunger signals are going to be because like personally where I came from, it was always two solid meals a day. Usually most days it was three, but then there were multiple kind of snacking opportunities too. So it was probably five or six eating opportunities. So the idea of going more than like three to four hours with nothing felt like, oh man, my, my hunger is just gonna be, it's gonna be a lot at a certain point. So that was kind of the, the limiting thought that I had. And when we start looking at, at this study and we start seeing, okay, over the first two to three weeks, some of the balancing of the hunger and the fullness signals. And then the way that at the end of the eight to 10 weeks, we found some good balance points in hunger and in fullness 
after just a matter of a couple of weeks with consistency. So, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to gloss over that first couple of weeks because that can be the point where we hear a lot of people go, well, I did try fasting. I tried alternate day or I tried OMAD or even maybe I tried the warrior fast at 20 slash four, but the hunger was just, it was just too much. And I just couldn't handle it. Like my coworkers, my neighbors were hearing my stomach grumble, you know, all kinds of all kinds of stuff like that. But the first two to three weeks is important. But so are a few other variables that we'll talk about, too, like food choices and, you, you know, your actual fasting timing and to understand what's going on and the fact that we can push through some of that. And there's kind of a light at the end of the tunnel, if you will. And the tunnel is not even necessarily that long of a tunnel, but it's important to understand. So big picture, you know, they were looking at a modified ADF, so 25% intake on your fast day, right? Like you had mentioned, mm -hmm. alternated with a feed day. Whether or not it modulates hunger, fullness, and gut peptides, that enhances dietary compliance and weight loss, right? That was the thing. They're saying, yeah, there's other articles out there that show this, and there's other research that shows that, but what about the hunger component? What about the compliance component? So we always start beginning with the end in mind, right? Like we want mm -hmm. this to be a lifestyle. We want to maintain those changes and not give it all back, like 95% yes. of the population. We right. want to keep it, own it, and and you know step into that new identity of like, yes, this is I'm healthy, I'm lighter, I'm mm -hmm. more confident. All of those wonderful things that this come. This is with. how I do things now. Right, and yep. there, there's a strong reason for it. Right, so that's why I love the fact that we're looking at the enhancement of the dietary compliance. Right, because we you've been fasting for a while and the needle's not moving or you've been plateaued. It's probably time to take a break, like a fast break. Mm -hmm. Take a break, open up your windows, mix it up, switch it up. You shouldn't always be dieting, right? I don't care if you're in the calorie in, calorie out camp or if you're in the carb insulin model of obesity or insulin camp of weight gain and weight loss, right? It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. There has to be this, like we call it momentary maintenance or pause or plateau, like your body's physiologically going to do stuff. So how are you going to navigate that for the long-term success, right? Mm -hmm. That's why bodybuilders don't stay at 4% all the time, right? It's not healthy <laughs> to be that right. lean, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so I love this. They were looking at obese subjects, eight weeks. There was a two-week baseline to start. So it was actually 10 weeks, like I mentioned earlier, but I didn't make that clear. And so compliance and weight loss in regards to hunger, right? So not surprising, after eight weeks, 3.9 kilos, so four kilos, so over eight pounds lost. Mm -hmm. Fat-free mass went down 1.4 kilos. Fat mass down over 2.2 kilos. Visceral fat mass came down slightly, right? Mm -hmm. And resting metabolic rate came down as well, but within the normal expectations of when you lose, you know, eight to 10 pounds or a certain percentage of your body weight. Sure. Yeah. So I think that, that's important to understand. Like when you get into, hey, I, I have this fat to lose, there will be a drop right there where, hey, maybe it's 100 calories, maybe it's a 200 calories, depends on, on exactly how much you've lost at that point. But that the fact that that's going to be part of the equation, because if I don't internalize that before, like I don't have the end in mind, like you just mentioned, then if I went back to exactly what I used to eat or exactly what I had on my old plates, then it would be a little bit too much later on, you know, and that can be an issue. And that can also be part of why some of those plateaus hit me at certain times because I haven't got used to that yet. Yeah. And so this is the second part of it, right? So it's that app, that application, that feeling component. Okay. What, what kind of, how am I interpreting this? So mm -hmm. I love that. After all of those decreases, there was still leptin and insulin. So we want leptin to come down. We want insulin to come down. So that was great. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. AUC, so area under the curve. We did a whole episode on this in the past. Ghrelin levels increased slightly. Mm. So you're like, ghrelin, well, that's a hunger hormone. Ghrelin, your stomach's growling. It's a mechanical hormone. When your stomach is empty, it elevates to say, feed me, right? Mm. But yeah. it says, despite these metabolic changes, there was no increase in subjective hunger by the end of the study. Furthermore, wow. fullness in PYY, which is a peptide released in the GI tract, increased fullness in PYY increased, satiety increased, weight and all the other fun metrics decreased, leptin decreased, insulin decreased. Yeah. But ghrelin slightly increased as well. But there was no sense of increased hunger. Hmm. So that means like feelings of fear of missing out hunger, which can hit you too, especially in the middle of a fast, weren't insurmountable. Like we hear as kind of a, a fear or an objection point 
you know, coming into fasting. And so that, that's that's a really cool thing. I think maybe the PYY, which has a more longer lasting effect on your satiation and not needing to feel like you, you need to bring in more food is was probably longer lasting than those increases in the mechanical, the stomach growling, the ghrelin, you know, type symptoms. So you can make a little bit longer term decision. So you weren't feeling this like insatiable or emotional hunger that you felt like you, you needed to just like quench, you know, in the moment, which is a really good thing. Yeah. And that peptide YY is really cool. Um, and I want to make sure we highlight a couple of things in this ADF study, because one mm -hmm. of the things we'll hear often, Tommy, is, yeah, I got to go low carb to fast. I got to be low carb to fast. Yeah. We do know that if you have more refined processed carbohydrates, alcohol, those types of things, you will have more cravings typically the following day if you're attempting to fast. For sure. PYY is stepping into the gap, this peptide YY, and saying, well, no, you're still satiated. You're okay. Mm -hmm. It can combat some of this. It's acting but it on was, the nervous system. It is. So it's yeah. not, It yeah, that's, that's a really key component. So it's actually, you know, operating in conjunction with your digestive system. So the interesting thing here was the breakdown of macronutrients for the, the fast day meals, the mini meal, mm -hmm. was 24% fat, 16% protein, and 60% carbohydrates. Mm, ouch. That's standard that's, American that's diet. That's not optimal. Yeah. That's not low carb. And they still lost weight and had all of these wonderful benefits, right? Good compliance. So, yeah. Right? A great compliance. Mm -hmm to beginning with the end in mind, right? Which is something they wanted to dietary adherence, right? They wanted to look at that. Yes. Overall in the study, the consumption numbers were very similar. The carbs came down slightly, protein went up slightly and fat went up slightly for the ad libitum days, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting here going, you're on a fat, a mini meal day. And I'm thinking, man, you're really setting yourself up for failure here. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because you're adding in all of these. I'm thinking like, did they have a croissant inside of a biscuit with a, like a little <laughs> thing, a pad of butter and like one slice of deli meat? Like, how do oh, you. Man. Right. So you had said something yeah. earlier. Maybe in, like a in, high protein candy bar. Like it, right? I mean, it sounds like a terrible way to, <laughs> to interrupt that. So I'm just envisioning fast. real life here. Like, man, like that doesn't seem like a long term solution. But still, the results showed. So we were we were postulating before we went and found the answer, Tommy, was in regards to peptide YY, I was like, well, my guess would be protein. Protein has the most satiation. Yeah. It has the most stomach effect of food. And yeah. that's not what we found. No. So as, as far as PYY, which we would be, it, it would benefit us to have higher levels of PYY, especially during a fast, during an alternate day fast like that. And what we actually see is that a low carb, high fat meal will actually have a 1.5 fold greater PYY excretion level versus a low fat, high carb meal. And so low fat, high carb is pretty much what we saw in this experimental design. So the PYY levels could have been even much better to help with the longer term feelings of satiation and fullness to kind of combat those in the moment, you know, kind of hour by hour levels of, of hunger and, and stomach growling and things like that. So this could have been optimized more effectively. And that would just speak to the, the long term effects of it, right? Mm hmm. You know, so when we're looking at this overall at baseline, they did a food record, right? So they looked at where the macronutrient energy supply was coming from. And at beginning and end, it was only 1% off difference. So the 49% of energy came from carbs, where the, the mini meal, the meal on the air quotes fast days was closer to 60%. And then 36% fat and 16% protein. So it's encouraging, I would hope right? That you don't have to do it all at once. And the slow decrease over the eight weeks, right? After the two-week baseline. And then the visual representation in these graphs was really cool to see that hunger, right? Was lower the majority of the time, except that three-week mark was really the, the deciding factor. Yeah, Fullness was higher in the ADF group, right? I mean, mm -hmm. excuse me, at the, at the end of 10 weeks, Ghrelin was higher. Well, wait a minute. That's not good. Eh, it's okay. PYY was higher, which is what we want, even with not the best percentage of macronutrients, right? Because we know PYY responded better to fat. And then this really interesting little thing called glucagon-like peptide 1, GLP-1, which has been all over the news in terms of 
these medications, these diabetic medications that are being used, Ozempic, et cetera, Rigovis, mm -hmm. to stimulate weight loss. Well, we want GLP-1. It causes an insulin response to bring down blood sugar, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the GLP-1 was actually higher at, in the 10-week group as well, which is a natural process that we want to embrace when we break our fasts. And that's why we always say breaking your fast is important by putting intention into what you're breaking your fast with. Yeah. Wow. That's a good point. And that's also where some of the carbohydrates are not the devil, you know, right? Like carbohydrates shouldn't be completely just eliminated forever for most people because they're necessary just to stimulate things like the GLP-1 release and some of the balancing of, of the hormones. If we go too much to the other side and just keep it there, the beneficial effects can wear down over time. But then also there's a mental effect of, I only feel like I can move the needle when I'm completely off carbs. And that doesn't tend to do well with benefiting the actual fast that we're on right there. And in this study, they also mentioned one of the limitations being the fact that they weren't monitoring blood sugar or ketones during the study. And that we know from personal experience that, you know, if you've ever monitored blood sugar or ketones, that there's definitely a large effect of where are my blood sugar numbers? Where are my ketones? And how am I feeling right now? There's a level of, you know, understanding what state of the fast you're kind of in at that point. And it, it's correlated with what you've eaten recently, how long this fast is, how much weight I have to lose, all of these kind of things like, you know, factor into play. But oftentimes when my stomach is growling the, the most, that means my blood sugar is relatively like low in a, in a really good range, but also ketones tend to be higher at that point, which means I've been in fat burning mode a bit longer on average, which is a really cool thing to know too. And I think that's where the idea of this data point, right, comes into play. So we're going to give you an action step at the end on how to put ADF and how to use it, right, and how to transition into it. Yeah. But, you know, we're not saying that you should be eating 75% carbohydrates all day, every day. And if it fits into your macros, then go ahead and do it, right? Especially if you're in the diabetes prevalent group or you have cardiovascular issues or you are on the path or you're pre-diabetic or you're trying to reverse diabetes, right? We want to get those down mm -hmm. as low as possible. but we also don't want to paint ourselves into a corner. And that's why I love this article when they talk about dietary adherence or compliance, long-term compliance, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to know how to manage this and, and having some of that information is really knowing blood sugar and ketones is really powerful. That's why I love the visuals and the charts and, and what they kind of did. And I'll wrap it up with a discussion. I'll just read a section of kind of their main takeaway from this article in just a second. But that's where mm -hmm. NutriSense has really come in. Tommy to showing me where I'm at during the process, either confirming or denying my hunger <laughs> and my justification yeah. <laughs> for what I want to do with that hunger, right? Oh, that's a great So point, yeah. that's why we've partnered with NutriSense, combines cutting edge tech with human expertise. So you can see how your body responds to food. And then we mentioned it recently about stress and sleep and exercise in real time. Never mind that, you also get the biosensor that you put on your arm, completely painless, connects right to the app that you can scan. So the CGM plus the NutriSense program, plus that dietitian guidance, plus the app, plus the visuals, it allows you to see where your blood sugar levels are and how well you're doing with adapting your fasting lifestyle. So that's where like an application like this would be cool because this is a, you know, a 10 week study. We're going to encourage you here with our action step here in a minute to apply this in a way, a strategic way to get long-term adherence or long-term compliance. But having a tool like the CGM has been absolutely like just incredible for me to be able to see things in real time. So yeah. that way I'm able to either confirm or deny, right? Like I was saying, like I can either, yeah. okay, I'm doing great. I don't need to change anything or wow, this is really hunger. And, you know, my blood sugar is doing great right now. Do I really want to go make this food related decision, right? Mm. Do I want to follow the guidelines in this study and do 60% carbohydrate? Probably not because I know that's yeah. how that's going to make me feel. So you get all of these outcomes, weight loss, stable energy, better sleep, understanding the food relationship. So you can head to NutriSense.io forward slash fasting for life. NutriSense.io forward slash fasting for life. You get a $30 off code and you get free one month dietitian support. So nice. the last piece of this, Tommy, is how we're going to apply an ADF lifestyle to get results, right? Hmm. So before we kind of walk through what that would look like, I want to read the takeaway from the article. And this says compensatory okay. increases in hunger following weight loss from continuous energy restriction, either calorie in calorie out model or fasting 
are well documented for diet and exercise induced weight loss. Eat less, move more. Mm -hmm. However, the effect of ADF induced weight loss on hunger sensations has only been assessed in a handful of studies. So this is what they're about to say. Contrary to continuous regimens, results from these trials indicate that hunger decreases or remains unchanged after three to 12 weeks of intervention. So again, not an overnight, one fast kind of wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, I got my result, right? right. Yeah. However, they say the previous studies are flawed that the hunger ratings were only measured at one point in time in a non-fasted state. Ah. The goal of this trial was to see if these reductions in hunger by ADF could be replicated if a meal challenge test was imposed before and after eight weeks of the program. And they show that the area under the curve for hunger did not increase when baseline was compared to post-treatment. And they also measure postprandial changes in ghrelin. And those, we already mentioned those as well. So I love that differentiation point here and why I think ADF and why we still believe that ADF is such a powerful tool when used properly. Oh yeah, thousand percent it is. And I love the fact that, you know, in this study, the fat loss that they got was over a steady decline over the full 10 weeks of the study. What was also interesting is just the fact that, you know, you, you did have that initial week or so where it was a little bit more of, of kind of a whoosh, if you will, like a little bit more came off of the scale from that baseline period. But those hunger and satiety feelings didn't really like balance out just yet. So knowing that and going, okay, if I'm going to, you know, start off on a new ADF regimen, committing to it for something like 30 days would be a really good thing because the, a lot of people that we've talked to and that kind of ask questions and, and things like that will say, you know, I, I tried it for a week. I tried it for a few days. I tried it a few times. I kind of dabbled. I dipped my toes in. But then, you know, it was it was uncomfortable or I was hungrier than normal, that kind of thing. So I totally get it. And this experimental design was was one of the, the better ones that we've seen as far as measuring these kind of things. And it supported that feeling as well. But it also supports the fact that 30 days in, you would have a pretty good opportunity to balance those things out and are very, very likely to not feel, you know, excess hunger and to actually, you know, feel more satiated longer term, even if you, you know, you're, you're feeling your stomach growl and things like that. It's definitely within reason. So I think that's a really good thing. Yeah. And I mean, everybody comes, you know, I shouldn't say everybody, we hear it often where I got to cut out the carbs. I got to go low carb. And for long-term mm -hmm. health, I am predominantly lower carbohydrate. I feel better. I sleep better. I function better. Right. Me too. Yeah. So I live that lifestyle. Heck, recently I've been doing carnivore and I've, I'm even done a lion protocol for 30 days, mm -hmm. right? Where it's just red meat, salt, and water. And it's been incredible. Now, long-term sustainability, that's up to the individual. So just like I really want to do an entire episode on just this one, Tommy, because you said, yeah, it's a great study, great framing, really cool outcomes. You know, we want to look at that ongoing compliance, right? That ongoing lifestyle. I don't even like the yeah. word diet, which has been used sure. all throughout. Can I stick with this? Right. So they say future trials should examine whether these changes in appetite and gut peptides are transient or persist over time with added weight loss and sustained weight maintenance, right? Mm -hmm. So you need the repetitions. You need a little bit more time. We did an article an episode on keto, right? Using keto as a therapeutic approach to weight loss or diabetes reversal for 90 days at a time. Yeah. Similarly with ADF, it's, you know, or OMAD or any fasting window you choose, sticking with it and being consistent over time, you got to give it time to work. And it was cool to see that that three to four week mark here is really where they started to see those changes, right? And that's not something you, that's not mm. abnormal to the weight loss and fitness world, right? That three to four week mark, right? Where you start to work out and you don't see the change in the mirror that day, right. but you wait, yeah. you know, three or four weeks, like, oh yeah, now I can notice that little tricep. Oh yeah, I can sure. notice my chin's a little thinner or leaner, right? Yeah. So when you're transitioning into ADF, don't feel like you got to just, you know, go down to zero carb right away. The study, again, had 50%, right? Very similar to standard American diet. So change one thing at a time. Stick to it for a few weeks. Then transition to playing with those macros and increasing the protein, keeping the fat pretty stable, and then decreasing those carbohydrates. And that mm. you will see as well is more consistent, sustained weight loss throughout the process. Yeah, that, that's a really cool idea. And, and, you know, the less things that you change all at once, all at the same time, the more it feels like I can get one under my belt. And then I can start living into that. I can, I'll start to feel that, you know, maybe some of those changes are, are coming a little bit more automatically. I'm kind of getting used to them and then bring in 
bring in the next change after that, that feels much more sustainable. Whereas if I just went, you know, black, white on off, like really quick, changed everything, try to get everything right all at once. Well, I'm not discouraging like making big changes if you feel like you need to, you know, but at the same time, if you just jump in, you know, full steam ahead, but then get off track, get derailed, sometimes it can be very hard to kind of get that momentum back and get myself back yep. on track. So what would be cool here would be to apply ADF in a way that you can you can do it, giving it a few weeks to kind of, you know, balance out some of those hunger hormones and then look for some of those, you know, improved food decisions that you can make on on most of those days and then it should, you know, after a couple of weeks, it would be even easier to make some good nutrition choices too, or maybe kind of reevaluate how you put together, you know, your plate or, you know, what you're eating on most of those days and kind of watching, watching the beneficial effects compound from both of those, both of those tracks because the fasting matters, but then what I'm eating when I do break my fast matters a lot too, you know, there's two sides to that coin. Yeah. And if you want to keep the momentum going, or you want to get some support in this, head to the show notes, you can click the link for our Fasting for a Life community. It is a empowering, it is a positive group of fast fellow fasters looking to apply the fasting lifestyle just like we did. So head to the show notes, click the link. We'll see you on the inside. You can also download our Fasting for Life blueprint. It is a 20-page PDF. It gives you some of the science behind it, some of the why, how to apply different fasting schedules into yeah. your day-to-day -day life. And as always, Tommy, great conversation, sir. Appreciate that. And we'll talk soon. Yeah, thank you. Bye. So you've heard today's episode and you may be wondering, where do I start? Head on over to thefastingforlife.com and sign up for our newsletter where you'll receive fasting tips and strategies to maximize results and fit fasting into your day-to-day -day life. While you're there, download your free fast start guide to get started today. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to leave us a five-star review and we'll be back next week with another episode of Fasting for Life.